host. Yeah. Hi, Uwe. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. Hello. So over to Dr. Kavita Lagate. Yeah. Good evening. I am very happy to welcome you all on this occasion of Wednesday Wisdom Webinar. BMA Masterclass in association with Jamnalal Bajaj Institute of Management Studies, University of Mumbai. Professor Philip Kotler, who is joining us now, Professor Voldemort, Professor Ube, all the respected past presidents of Bombay Management Association, my colleagues on executive committee of Bombay Management Association, invited guests, colleagues from academia and students and participants. Indeed, it's a great day for Bombay Management Association to have the marketing guru himself, Professor Philip Kotler, along with Professor Voldemort and Uwe, talking about their latest book on human-to-human -human marketing. 67 years of legacy, Bombay Management Association, since its establishment in 1954, has pioneered efforts to help enhance managerial effectiveness and improve the standards of business management in India. It is widely regarded as one of the best management association in India, accredited for the training and development of innumerable managers. We, we organize conferences, workshops, learning and development initiatives, MDPs, management week, industry visits, book reading meets, book reviews, etc on the latest topics and relevant themes of management and leadership. These subjects address the futuristic challenges in multiple domains of industry and emerging economy. Over the last three years, we have evolved into many significant initiatives such as Digital Leadership Summit, 10X Conclave, aligned with the digital transformation and entrepreneurial wave, which has redefined the way global ecosystem is functioning. Our another offer, Leader Next, is based on the World Economic Forum's uh, identified te uh, top 10 uh, core skills to be the most desired by the employers in this uh, decade. To effectively manage in VUCA world, BMA, along with Jamnalal Bajaj Institute of Management Studies, have collaborated to design a customized and futuristic learning and development intervention, which is called as Leader Next. It is in continued endeavor as a proactive thought leader to enhance the corporate and academic partnership. Bombay Management Association has launched an innovative and very powerful network platform titled as Innothon. Innothon is envisioned to create an opportunity for a tripartite collaboration of young brains and professors of the management institutes of Mumbai with the managers and leaders from the industry. This gets culminated as Dandekar Trophy, which is sponsored by ACC from 2019-20 uh, onwards. Contributions by individuals and in the field of management are uh, annually recognized through prestigious BMA awards in various categories and are valued by the industry. To reach out to our members and stay connected with them during this Corona-19 pandemic, we have shifted very swiftly to these offerings on the online mode. The regular MDPs now are offered as every week, Friday Fundamental and Wednesday Wisdom Webinar. In this Wednesday Wisdom Webinar, we have introduced two very interesting initiatives, the masterclass and celebrating the Indian managers who made a difference. This series are directed towards creating the awareness among the young students and corporates 
about the indian managers who have made a difference master classes are the classes where the eminent professors speakers from all over the world are invited and we are benefiting by that in the same series today we have this master class jamna lal bajaj institute of management studies a name that has always been synonymous with the first class uh, quality management education in india for the past 5 decades uh, jamna lal bajaj a department of university of mumbai has been in the proximity of the biggest corporate uh, uh, area of the country and we get benefit out of that the who's who of the industry are alumni of this prestigious institute we are very happy to be associated with bombay management association for this particular master class i welcome you all once again and hand it over to uh, rishi jagmohan singh who is a passionate leadership coach and digital mentor who is working for vocard limited as head of learning and development and digital experience experiences to take the processing ahead thank you thank you kavita ji <clears throat> good evening everybody uh, i am sure each one of you is equally excited and of course after seeing the gurus over here i am afraid i am lost of words and i can uh, see professor kotler professor waldemar and professor uwe over here with their latest uh you know gift to us that is hwh marketing but before we begin friends uh, let me quickly do a quick poll and i would like to have your answers uh <clears throat> okay so let me quickly uh, you know uh, request all of you to please uh, log into this uh, you can take a qr scan this qr code and you can log into menti.com and the code is given over there 53887501 i request you all to please scan this or you can directly log into menti.com uh, i am just uh, sharing the screen over here give me a moment yeah can you see my screen now yeah so please, you can please. scan the code it's a mentimeter and uh, you will be able to scan this code or you can directly go if you're not able to get the login details you can directly go to menti.com and the code is ready for you to start it seven and the code is 53887501 in fact let's do it quick because i believe uh, professor kotler professor waldemar and professor owe is there and we are all excited to you know get into the action and he love to hear from him accordingly i am now stopping sharing this uh, uh this slide and uh, if you have got into logged in over there i would want you to please get into the answers for that particular thing and now we are you must have got an answer for this particular i'm just sharing the screen over here and uh, okay so i'm i'm putting the screen over here how are you feeling yeah i can see it now you are already started entering the numbers over there and as of now these are the cl word cloud which i'm getting are you feeling excited you happy great amazing wow lot of words i think the word cloud is getting getting bigger and bigger and uh, i think great participation by everybody <laughs> over here thank you very much before we begin i would want to go to next question and that is something which is a important one and that talks about as per you h2h marketing deals with what please start entering your preferences on this it does it deal with principles of marketing does it deal with design thinking does it deal with storytelling does it deal with digital marketing okay okay that's good we have got the ratings over here many of you think it is in the range of 
principles of marketing, storytelling. Okay. So <clears throat> let me stop here over here. And I think all the points are getting almost equal points. That is uh, principles of marketing, design thinking, storytelling, and of course, digital marketing, of course. So let me stop this Mentimeter over here and I will come back to the presentation slides. And the presentation slides, uh, I would like to give uh, the introductions. Uh, let me start with uh, Professor Voldemort. Professor Voldemort, I'll uh, share the screen over here first. And I would like, love to give his introductions. Yep. Professor Voldemort coming from Forzheim Business School and Forzheim University of Applied Sciences and, and comes from Forzheim Germany. And uh, it's a pretty long introduction. Please bear with me. Professor Voldemort is a professor emeritus of uh, international business at the Forzheim University, Germany, and lectures at B2B Marketing and Industrial Brand Management. He's a lecturer at Mannheim Business School, and of course, at SEM Shanghai and uh, Technical University Munich, Albon. He also teaches at IIM Kolkata, ITM Sweden, and Graduate Business School of Isan, Lima, Peru. From 2007 to 2010, he was visiting associate professor at CEIBS, China, Europe, International Business School, Shanghai, and 1989 to 91 at Kellogg Graduate School in Ma of Management, Northwestern University, and lecturer for strategic management at Lake Forest Graduate School of Management. He has taught online with the University of Maryland Graduate School. At the start of his career, he was a research assistant at Technical University of Berlin. Uh, Dr. Fortesch has uh, extensive experience in uh, uh, management consulting in US, Europe, and China. His earlier positions include sales and strategy positions at Siemens in Germany and the US, and being an economic advisor at United Nations Industrial Development Organization in Sierra Leone, West Africa. His research interests have, uh, were in, have evolved over the globalization of high-tech companies and their marketing and branding efforts. His newest research is focusing on human-to-human -human marketing of the industrial companies. So I will come back to the other introductions uh, later on. And with this, I request Professor Voldemort to please take it forward. Thank you very much for introducing me. Sounds great. Um, we have done lots of things and I enjoyed also working in India. I've been there many times. Actually, my first time to India was 1980. Um, where I was visiting various cities, Calcutta, um, Mumbai, uh, Delhi, uh, Bangalore. So in the meantime, India has changed a lot. Actually, we have started writing this book um, at uh, Bangalore. And uh, that was actually a super interesting experience. Uh, Uwe will tell us more about that. Um, um, I have prepared a small presentation which where I would like to introduce the principles which we have put together in this new book uh, with Phil and Uwe. And then I hope I can share my screen in a second. Um, actually, I'm disabled and need to become co-host again. So let me make co-host and then I will share the Maybe slides sir. which I, I I've put on. You can share it now, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Are the shares, uh, the, is the slides up? No, no, Valdemar. Oh, okay. uh, now it's right. coming. Now it's coming. All right. We see okay. it. Okay. All right. So I have, would like to give you a short introduction of the basic idea of the H2H -H marketing uh, principles geared to a global industry for the uh, um, Bombay Management Association. And I'm very happy that uh, Professor Legade gave us the introduction and thank you for to all the members of the uh, um, BMA to make this possible. Um, we have a new principle here and this new principle actually was built on all the um, um, 
activities and thinking of the last couple of years. And this um, would this uh, leads us to a little bit critical way of looking at marketing at the current stage. Uh, when we uh, look at uh, the uh, current situation of marketing and trying to understand uh, where the human to human marketing fits in, I would like to show you a graph with two dimensions, which shows on the one hand, the marketeers benefit, and on the other hand, uh, the customers benefit. And if I say there's some low and high, just to categorize that into um, two dimensions. Um, of course, if we don't have benefits for the marketeer and the customer, this would be pretty wasteful. Nevertheless, there are many activities out uh, because uh, companies start, sometimes there are government regulations, sometimes there are conditions which are not suitable. So this is actually also a situation we ha happen, uh, which, which we see. What happens very often, or what happens not so very often, but due to the situation now in the corona, we have lots of activities which benefit the customer, I think, which is good under the conditions where we are, where governments are supporting all kinds of activities to uh, uh, ease the situation and make the life of people uh, easier. Nevertheless, if you come from a um, company point of view, you would um, uh, do something not so nice, maybe stupid, whatever. We use the name inane here and say, okay, that is actually an area which needs improvement. What we see very often is actually the area where marketeers benefit a lot. Under our definitions, we say that it is unethical marketing. We think it is not good. It is uh, lofted to the, the one side where companies are actually having more benefits than the customer and that should not be done. That should be avoided because we are here to do things together. And therefore something in the middle, of course, it doesn't have to be exactly in the middle. It's, meanders around, but at the middle, there is something what we think should be beneficial for both sides, the side of the marketeer, the company, and the side of the customer, the, the people. And this, we would say, is the area of H2H marketing. I mean, many activities which we see currently in marketing are geared to take a disadvantage to the customer. And when we talk to people on the street, some people say, hey, this is only marketing, which means somebody is putting something in front of us, which does tell nice things, but doesn't bring the benefit to uh, the users. And therefore, we think this should be avoided. We think there should be a middle row where both uh, parties who are involved in this uh, interaction between individuals and companies should benefit more. And therefore, this is the area where H2H marketing appears. Of course, this is a process which is continuously uh, in, uh, improving and companies and people are working in this area to make it happen. Um, this uh, uh, is particularly important because we believe that there is a new paradigm in marketing which leads to the H2H, to, to the human to human marketing. And this new paradigm actually has been evolved over the last couple of years. We have here a timeline between 1900 and today, and this timeline shows roughly, and if you wanna have some more details, please read the second chapter of the H2H -H marketing book, because it describes the early beginnings of the marketing theory, uh, which came from national economics and moved into context theory and marketing theory. And then we have the, the area of uh, uh, market or orientation, up to the digital value orientation, and we have the area of classic sales theory to the newer paradigm of marketing. All of that is today put into the newest books, particular in Phil's marketing, um, marketing management and principles of marketing. But in the meantime, other important things have happened which we think are important. And one of them is the development of design thinking. Design thinking is a technique, is a way of doing new things. Of course, all marketing activities are based on innovation, but design thinking is a, is a technique which makes innovation more human oriented. And therefore we think the, um, 
combining uh, marketing concepts and design thinking leads to a better, more human oriented way of doing marketing. Um, around 2000, a new development came up, which is called service dominant logic. This new development from a conceptual point of view actually changed the way how companies are uh, approaching and servicing um, uh, the customers. And this new servicing, service dominant logic has a complete different way of looking at the customer because the customer is part of the co-creation process and the value which is created by the uh, companies is used by the customer and that use that you that customer creates more that is the reality today and if we incorporate that into the marketing uh, then we have actually a complete uh, new way of thinking and this new of way of thinking is accompanied by the third development which is here uh, let's say from the 1980s and that what we call today digitalization. In my personal life, um, um, I have been involved in digitalization uh, from the 80s. And I know how digitalization has changed um, industrial procedures, um, personal situations. And of course, now in the, in the pandem pandem pandemic, all teaching, all communication is more or less um, digitalized. What we're doing here is one example for it. It has some disadvantages, but nevertheless, it also has some great advantages. We can provide you up-to-date knowledge here right now. And with these three elements, digitalization, service dominant logic, and design thinking, also the marketing goes to a much higher level. Digitalization also has a very human aspect. Of course, it's technology driven, but we can reach individuals. Uh, the market segmentation goes to the one-to-one -one principle. So all together leads to a more human to human oriented marketing. So this is the conceptual evolution of the marketing uh, theory. And I think um, this is very important because it gives uh, number one, a time frame; number two, also a theoretical context of the activities what we are proposing here. So this uh, new concept has of course some very important influencing factors. I mentioned the three big one, let me repeat that. And in the speech from Uwe, we'll go actually much deeper into it. He will talk about more about service dominant logic, the design thinking, which I uh, just mentioned, and of course the digitalization. All these three elements are forming the basis of the H2H -H marketing model. And this basis creates the opportunity to do marketing in a different way. Very important and the fundamental of the new uh, concept is the H2H -H mindset. Because with the way we are thinking, with the way we are approaching uh, our activities, we do it, we can do it differently and we can create something very unique. And therefore, the mindset is important when we introduce this new concept. And that mindset is based on really a very specific customer-based view. There has been the resource-based view, there has been the marketing-based view, and we proposing actually putting all this together is a new way, and this new way is absolutely geared to the activities, what the customer wants. And if we understand that properly and combine that with the design thinking and the service dominant logic, and of course the digitalization, the outcome is a very different way of thinking. It is a mindset where the human activities in the way we create the value and in the way we are using the value is uh, um, put together and that kind of mindset, that kind of thinking, having the individual, having the human in mind creates a complete different opportunities for making uh, marketing activities. Um, in detail means that when we look at the design thinking that the uh, design thinking is clearly human centered. It has always the way uh, humans are acting together, the way humans want to um, have the 
uh, environment structured, they always look at the human aspect of the innovation. Design thinking is experimental. That's, that means we are trying things, we are testing things, we are looking around. Design thinking has empathy and design thinking has collaboration in their inner heart. So design thinking really creates a complete different way of approaching that. And that creates the basis for the new mindset in, through the new design thinking. The same is true for service dominant logic. The service dominant logic gives us the so-called service orientation, meaning we are moving away from the goods dominant logic to the service dominant logic. We are moving away from, or we're using resource-based view and uh, market-based view together. And we consider um, the value uh, created by the customer. The customer is not destroying the, the value. Uh, it's not eating up the things. The customer is actually using it to become stronger and create other things. And in the, in the service dominant logic, the principle of co-creation is a major part. So the relationship between um, the company or supplier and uh, uh, customer is a joint, is a way of working together, which is under the term of co-creation. In the digitalization, we have a similar thing, which is very much human oriented. It is interconnected thinking. So we are actually living in a shared economy where the connection between the various members of the uh, uh, network have opportunity to share and connect and also to uh, uh, do uh, transactions. Uh, digitalization is super agile, uh, continuously changing, continuously improving. And of course, we can set the priority for human over machine. And this is a priority which the people who are using the digitalization can set. Of course, the um, internet could be pretty automated, could be pretty uh, machine oriented. Uh, nevertheless, this machine oriented is controlled by people. And therefore we say digitalization has the opportunity to set the priorities on the human side and not so on, the, um, uh, on the machine side. And therefore the mindset which is created out of uh, digitalization, design thinking and service dominant logic uh, creates a complete new way or can create a complete new way how to deal with that. And of course, when we move on, then we see that trust and brands are very much in the focus of these activities. Um, these activities, of course, are wide dispersed. Uh, through the internet, we can reach the globe any minute um, and we can interact any time. And therefore the management principles for H2H uh, marketing are very much based on trust and of course uh, the brand of the companies. Um, I'm using the same framework and putting the H2H -H brand management in the middle of it. And if I look at the various single aspects um, of this model, uh, I look into the design thinking and here we have the brand formative design which is a principle which looks at the relationship between the things which are branded and the way it is designed. Therefore, it's called brand formative design. We look at the humanization of brands. Of course, there is a big array of uh, possibilities where um, the designers and the managers of brands can prioritize uh, the more human or the less human. We, of course, support the more human oriented and of course, the most important part, the brand should come from the customer point of view. We know that anyways, the brand is owned by the customers, but nevertheless, um, realizing that in the way we manage it is very important. And therefore, the new way of looking um, at uh, the age to age brand management is actually a very distinctive way to the traditional way of looking at it. Um, the service dominant logic um, um, sees the co-creation of the brand as a major part of it, um, meaning that uh, marketeer and customer are necessary to establish the brand and maintain the brand. 
And of course, the brand is an operand resource where things could be uh, applied at every second. And uh, we move from a, di a dyadic to a network perspective, which means they are not only single relationship, but they're multiple relationship and they're built together in a long, large and continuously improving network. And therefore the new um, B2B brand, uh, H2H brand management is actually very important. And the same is true for the digitalization. Uh, we have a new customer pass and I will come to that a little bit later. Uh, we have brand communities and uh, many F factors which make this possible. And of course, most important is the trust. Trusting in the things what we are doing because digitalization um, provides us not really tangible things and therefore all mechanisms are needed to build that trust because if we don't have the trust, things will not be realized by the uh, customers. And therefore, digitalization has an important role to play here. So when we look at the new uh, um, customer journey, we have physical touch points and we have digital touch points. And we are using here the uh, well-known aware, appeal, ask, act, and advocate approach. This uh, steps in the customer journey um, are the various phases where the customer go through. And of course, in the physical world, we have things like public relation, uh, TV ads, prints, still from the conventional, of course, word of mouth, we have in the physical world as also in the uh, digital world. Digital task touch points are of course banners or websites, uh, social media, all these kind of things which are making the brand aware and appeal. And then uh, it could go to uh, uh, contact center, telephone center, uh, shops, uh, family and friends, stores. Uh, and of course could go back to the digital world again. This is just a principal way of looking at the things where uh, content sites and rating are actually helping. Then you can buy through e-commerce or websites and then stores, consumption uh, usage, post-purchase services, and of course, um, blogs and social media again in the social world. So this new uh, customer journey, actually they, we know that customer journey, but the model which we're using here is new, really displays um, how um, the H2H marketing is actually happening on, in the process of uh, uh, the customer journey. And that model uh, makes it really nice to see what is possible. Of course, the variations of these models are very huge. It doesn't have to follow this principal path, which is displayed here. It could go a completely different one, but in principle, it shows you the possibility where uh, interaction will take place or can take place. And therefore, I think it makes sense to have this model in mind because it helps you to organize um, your activities. If you can jump some of these uh, steps, we'll come to it later, it will be helpful. But nevertheless, if you see this principal pass in front of you and see it in the reality of your business, the chances are high that you can actually, as a customer and also as, as a company, lead to a successful way of uh, um, interacting with your customer. <clears throat> when you have that in place, uh, and uh, the customer is uh, um, satisfied, then he can advocate. And this is actually the things what you really like. You want to have customers who are with you. Actually, the customer also wants it because it makes his life much more easier. And therefore, the customer is also willing to recommend uh, what he has experienced to other people. And that way back, is actually a very helpful one for the marketeer and for the customer. Uh, the marketeer gets more sales, gets more interaction, and uh, the customer gets more satisfaction and also uh, social interaction. The most important part is if I am rebuying, if I'm uh, loyal, I actually can jump. And that's what we call loyalty loop. So you can 
you hear about a new development, you hear about a new offering, you hear about a new solution. And of course, you don't need to go through all this uh, cycle. And therefore, uh, the jumping the loyalty loop, which leads to direct uh, purchase, is actually super helping. And therefore, uh, this model gives you the opportunity to think about activities where you can shortcut uh, all these um, um, kind of procedures. And nevertheless, the customer also sees it very helpful because it shortens his pain also. And therefore, we think this model is um, very exciting. And uh, we think with this model, you can actually move much quicker and much faster in the today's complex world. Well, if we look at this complex world, we also need to look into the future and find out what we can do. And we call that finding meaning in a troubled world. I mean, there is so much uh, trouble around so much uh, interference, so much uh, um, unnecessary things which we could avoid. Nevertheless, we are living in a historical context and that historical context here, we took actually 200 years. Um, we looked at the situation as it had been uh, in the 18th century. We talk here about the industrial world uh, and the agricultural uh, based society moved on to the industry based society, which is probably uh, occurring currently in India and other developing countries. And in the today's world, we have a knowledge-based society, which is mainly in the industrial world, but also in large parts of the uh, um, developing world. So I see India also reaching that uh, knowledge-based society stage uh, now. But of course, there will be a future. And the question is, of course, what kind of future do we have? Um, we are using here a term which is called resonance-based society, where the resonance between the acting members are actually positive. And we think if we are applying um, here H2H -H marketing, this resonance-based society could be reached. And therefore, we believe that the new H2H -H marketing concept is here to create a better world, a better world for all actors, a better situation for the participating members and of course for everybody in the world. And therefore I'm very happy to present that. Thank you very much for your attention. So can you unshare this? Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Waldemar. And I think uh, we have got a gist of it, uh, the H2H marketing. And we would, everybody is, uh, you know, uh, waiting to hear from the master, from the guru, Professor Philip Kotler, about what was the genesis of this particular book and how, how you have, uh, you know, ensured the customer journey in the digital world. And of course, uh, how have you incorporated the design thinking with, with the co-authors accordingly? And uh, how we can ensure the loyalty loops, which, is, which you are ensuring, through this uh, spiral customer journey, decision journey accordingly. So before, I, I, I don't think I'm going to do some kind of, uh, you know, formality, but uh, still I will do it because it is supposed to, I supposed to do it because uh, I, I, if I, if you read an introduction of Dr. Kotler, I mean, many people will be laughing at me, but still I will try to attempt to introduce Professor Kotler. And uh, many of you know Professor Kotler very well, uh, friends, uh, Professor Philip Kotler, it is my privilege and I'm having goosebumps still when I'm introducing sir uh, from Kellogg, Kellogg uh, Graduate School of Management, Northwestern University, Evanston, USA. And of course, a uh, <clears throat> little bit from, I mean, Professor Philip Kotler is one of the leading authorities in marketing. He, he was the S.C. Johnson and Son Distinguished Professor of International Marketing at Kellogg School of Management, Northwestern University, Evanston, Illinois. He received his master's degree at University of Chicago and his PhD degree at MIT, both in economics. He did his postdoctoral work in mathematics at Harvard University and in behavioral sciences at the University of Chicago. Professor Kotler is the author of Marketing Management, Analysis, Planning, Implementation, and Control, the most widely used marketing books in graduate business schools Worldwide, he has published 
over 100 articles in leading journals and several of which have received best article award. In fact, I have, of course, everybody who are attending this must have read the marketing management book of Professor Kotler. Professor Kotler was the first recipient of American Marketing Association AMA, Distinguished Marketing Educator Award 1985. The European Association of Marketing Cons Consultants and Sales Trainers awarded Kotler uh, their prize of marketing excellence. Uh, he was chosen as a leader in marketing thought by academic members of AMA in 1975 survey. He also received the 1978 Paul Converse Award of AMA honoring his original contribution to marketing. In 1989, he received annual Charles Coolidge Pollen Marketing Research Award. In 1995, the Sales and Marketing Executives International named him as the marketing of the year, marketer of the year. Professor Kotler has consulted for such companies like IBM, General Electric, AT&T, Honeywell, Bank of America, Merck, and others in, in the areas of marketing strategy and planning and marketing organizations and of course, international marketing. So uh, sir, I will stop sharing over here and I would request you to please share your thoughts. And I think everybody is waiting with bated breath because Professor Waldemar has already set the ball rolling with what H2H marketing is. Look to how hear your thoughts. Sir. Thank you very much for the introduction. I assume you can hear me pretty well, even though I'm thousands of miles away. Um, I'm a very long standing friend of India. Probably I've been to India earlier than either of my two colleagues because in 1955, I brought my wife to India to, uh, to, to glory and relish the culture the, the, the deep civilization of India. And it was a remarkable year for us. And I've been back many, many times, always learning new things. Uh, one of the things I pride myself on is having an open mind. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Gerald Zaltman, a uh, distinguished professor at Harvard University, is now working on a book called Open Mindedness. And the world, unfortunately, has moved toward mentalities that are frozen in conspiracy theory, frozen in uh, antagonistic theory toward others. Uh, so we, I've even told Jerry Zaltman to figure out how we could measure how open-minded a person is to new learnings, to new experiences, and new opinions but he, he may do something with that. However, I want to use our time, my time, to put a, uh, some background to the H2H book and how it evolved. And then uh, when I'm finished, uh, Professor Sponholz uh, will develop more deeply uh, much, of, much of the theory in the H2H book. Um, I always go back to one person one thought leader in explaining marketing, and that is uh, the distinguished prof uh, professor, Peter Drucker. Uh, you may not know that he was a professor. Most of you think he was just a columnist and a journalist. And Peter uh, is the reason we're here because what did he tell us that was so insightful? He said, the aim of a company is to create customers. Now, most people said, Peter, the aim of a, co a company is to create profits. Well, Peter said, without customers, you're not going to create profits. So please benefit your customers in a distinguished way so that they come back again and again. And so when I looked at the history before H2H, uh, I saw it in five stages. And we just call that 1.0 marketing, 2.0 marketing, 3.0, 4.0, 5.0. And very briefly, there was never a book on 1.0 or 2.0. There was only a book on 3.0 at the beginning. But in 3.0, we said, in the beginning, marketing was very functional. We thought people were rational. We would present a set of benefits that are compelling and they will buy the product. Um, we realized later that that is not how markets behave. In fact, 
maybe rational behavior is a minor uh, thing to happen in, in decision making, either by consumers or producers, that so much decision making is emotional. Balancing risks and uncertainties and coming to a decision that makes us feel comfortable in taking that decision. Uh, so we were really saying that we ought to move our marketing thinking from 1.0, which is functional marketing, to 2.0, which is emotional marketing. And then in the same book, 3.0, we finally said there's a third stage. Let's call it compassionate marketing. That the, the, the successful firm is compassionate about the people he's trying to serve, the way he's serving them. And, and about this, the situation of the society, which figures in. In fact, I really believe we're gonna eventually have a term called ecosystem marketing. Namely that we're all parts of a larger ecosystem. We're affected by many aspects of society besides the satisfaction of a, a specific need to drink something or to eat something. How do other things affect where we stand? And we'll call that ecosystem marketing eventually. But we then re uh, realized that marketing is fundamentally impacted by the digital revolution. And it's gonna change so much about marketing practice. It's not gonna stop 30 second commercials. It's not going to stop a, a lot of uh, print ads and all that. In fact, save what you've got, of, save the best of traditional marketing, but join it to digital marketing, social media marketing. Uh, and that's the future. So we had to write 4.0 marketing in a book about how the digital revolution will affect the practice of marketing. And then uh, more recently, we did a book on 5.0 marketing because there were so many new tools coming into marketing, technical tools that are part of the digital revolution, but independently uh, things to pay attention to. And one of my uh, very uh, admired people, I admire very much V Kumar, V Kumar, uh, and his book called Intelligent Decision-Making uh, or Intelligent Analysis, I'm trying to remember the title, in which he takes eight or nine new tools of marketing and devotes a chapter to each. Now by a tool of marketing, what do I mean? How about uh, virtual reality? After all, if you're gonna develop a new product, uh, why don't you pre-test it? Why don't you put it down on uh, in a doc, why not create a film showing this wonderful product and its use? Of course, it doesn't exist. It's just a virtual representation, but it gives the customer an idea of it. And then you say to the customer, would you buy that? Why would you? Why would you not? Uh, are there any improvements that you think could be made uh, that you have seen in the film? And so on. So just the tool of virtual uh, uh, analysis, uh, rea virtual reality, we even sometimes call it augmented reality. We aug augment things and so on. So that's just one. What about 3D marketing? Now it's even being called 5D marketing uh, with a certain variation where you not only make a physical object out of just turning and, and taking, making something out of clay essentially, uh, but to make it very strong, because often if this is a part that is going to be under a lot of pressure and stress, stress, you have to use three, 5D marketing to make it, be, 3D won't make it hard enough and strong enough to survive the pressures. Anyways, that, that's a second tool, 3D marketing. What about neuroscience and the fact that um, we can measure the brain and what's happening in people's minds when they are exposed to a, uh, a, let's say a testimonial, let's, let's expose a, a mis, 
Miss W saying something about a product and let's see what happens to the listener's brain by putting on the head of the person voluntarily uh, a measuring system of whether anything happened in her brain waves for any word that she may have said during the one minute description of what she was trying to sell. So neuroscience can be used to spot things happening in the human mind with, with words we use and the, even the person who's delivering it and the face of the person uh, and so on and so forth. So I won't go over all those tools. This is all by the way of background that we moved into not only in 4.0 digital revolution, but in 5.0, all of the tools that are coming out uh, that marketers uh, can benefit from. Now, I wanna say something that's very interesting. Every tool has to be tested and some of them have to be dropped because they're not really working. And the best story to tell about that is what happened at Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble got very enthusiastic about the new digital revolution and about social media. So their budget was shifted from heavy, heavy, only uh, 30 second commercials to a mix of 30 second commercials and the, uh, the new um, uh, social media. And they learned a lot. They learned so much that now their budget for social media has gone down. But that's to be expected. Their job was to use everything that could work and find out what really works. And then finding out what really works, their budget is back to a more normal equilibrium uh, because now they won't do X with social media or Y with social media, but they've learned. So don't, to those managers who I'm talking to, don't worry about spending a lot of money on social media, media, your effort is to find out what works and then put aside what doesn't work. Okay, now furthermore about background uh, for the book and so on. Uh, the, the, const, the concept of the customer journey was always implicit anyways, but in, in, our, in our earlier book 4.0 marketing, we really worked on the five stages of, a, of moving toward the purchase. And now today we're, we're happy to say that your companies, we hope, are mapping customer journeys. Uh, visualize it this way. Every time, if you're running an auto dealership, every time a customer stops in, please find out what you can about his or her journey. When did they decide even they needed a car? If they decided that. that. And what did they do before they arrived at your place? What ads did they see? What got them to make your car a candidate in their mind? And how was the experience? And how many walked out without buying anything? And you never saw them again. And did you post study those people who walked out and, and didn't buy anything? Uh, so this is the journey is your way to learn touch about touch points, because probably many, many touch points occurred both digitally and uh, physically in the customer's journey. And you have to make sure that every time you're at, that you're at every touch point that could be a significant influence on purchasing that car and that you're there in a distinguished way, you, you, you're, you're engaged and those touch points in a positive way, because anyone could be a moment of truth and drop you from the journey at that point. Uh, every moment counts. So check on your position in the touch points of a customer journey. Now I wanna say something else that uh, has been of, of interest and that is brands are essentially the, 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 the stuff of, of marketing. <laughs> Some people think that marketing is what not for 
it's not important anymore. It's just branding. No, but there's no branding until you some you made decisions on what to produce and what to call it and name it and price it and advertise it. So marketing's the big ship. Branding is part of it. But we have been interested in moving towards something we call uh, brand activism. And brand activism means that the brand is not just describing a physical product and its price and where to get it. It has a value system. It, 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 it comes out of a value system that says something about the company, the supplier of this product that may, we might envy or not envy. Of course, the brand company will want it to be a positive value that is being communicated. So brand activism is to try to be clear about the values your company stands for and that your employees stand for. If It's not that the CEO has these values. The company has to have a culture and the culture uh, is a set of values and it will attract those customers who share those values. Now, maybe you're going to lose some customers who, when they learn about your company's values, because their values are at the opposite end, but you never get everyone anyways. And to become clearer about what counts uh, about your com company and how to communicate it is written up in a book I wrote uh, with uh, Christian Sakar recently called Brand Activism where we have many, many illustrations of uh, companies that have been dynamic in, in forging a brand image. And anyone can tell you what that company believes in as a result. Uh, and uh, one more thing that I think we, got, we, we have to add to H2H uh, that uh, uh, has to do with more the ecosystem view. Here's the story. To what extent should a company comment on the state of society in the work it does in selling its products and services? This all came about earlier when it was the issue of pollution and talk began that air is getting bad in some places because of all the smoke coming out of the factories and so on. And maybe even it went into ocean pollution, a lot of plastic in the water, uh, hurting the rivers and oceans. Uh, so we had to have some statement made by companies of the sort that we as a company are not polluting. We are cutting down on any pollution that might have been occurring. Okay. It got even a bigger problem when we expanded it to the view of the climate change that's happening, that basically we're heating up the world. The world's getting hotter. And uh, it's because of the fuel dependency, the, the dependency on, on, on these fuels that are going to um, put gases in the air and keep the planet having more heat and therefore causing the waters to rise uh, and uh, polar bears to die and uh, coastal cities to be flooded. And you know the picture. So climate change. Shouldn't a company show that it's not contributing to climate change of that negative kind? Yes, uh, if they do it in a light way, we call that uh, uh, oh, green lighting, green lighting. So it's a pejorative term. They, they really aren't doing much about it, but they want to sound good. Uh, the smart companies are doing a lot about it. But then it went into, uh, do, there are hungry, hungry people in the world. There are uh, homeless people in the world. Should a company take any stands on, that, on those issues? That's, that's, that's a hard thing to, to ask. Yesterday, by the way, or a couple of days ago, you, you, remember, you, you must have all been dazzled by the beauty of the space uh, trip that Richard Branson uh, and his company uh, uh, succeeded in. It was a marvelous thing, everyone. So talk more of mankind to be able to get into into near space, as they call it, near space. Uh, others were critical. I was very critical. 
that all that money being spent on space at this time when we don't deliver a good education or a good health system uh, and so on, that this is that we've allowed three billionaires to have toys. Space is important, but they, they would make a bigger impression on me if they would be putting some billions into problems that, we, that are here on earth. All right, that's a personal thing. But the real question that H2, that follows from H2H that we did not address that clearly is, but could be added is what are the responsibilities of CEOs and companies toward the social issues in the ecosystem and what responses would make sense for companies to take? What stands can they take? to show that they too want not only a better world, but they, they are H to H oriented, human to human, that they want to make sure. So I've done a lot of work recently in the two things that matter in society. How happy are the people and how healthy are the people? And it led me to writing an article called is America ready for Nordic capitalism? What do I mean by that? If you look carefully, you'll see that the uh, only thing measured about the performance of an economy is the gross domestic product, G GDP. And by the way, GDP is gonna grow in good and bad ways. For example, if we all smoke more cigarettes, GDP has gone up, we're buying more cigarettes. If we make more military equipment, GDP goes up. What we need to know is what if impact is marketing and other activities have, having on the happiness of the people and the health. So I studied that and I looked at the United States. We're number 16 in happiness that's called the gross national happiness measure. And we're 19 in, in health. But every Nordic country is in the top 10. Everyone is in the, probably the lower half of the top 10, the, the first five. And I'm talking about Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland, and Iceland, the five Nordic countries. Scoring so high in happiness and health, that it's a contest now. Last year, Finland was number one in happiness, for, actually for two years in a row, but three years ago was Denmark. That's what they're fighting for. Who's happier? Not that, but because in most countries, no one, there's not, not any happiness, basically. Here they're fighting, who's the happiest? So the answer is government, has decided in those countries to tax higher, not a 39% tax, top tax rate, like in the United States, but a 60 or 70% tax rate in their countries so that they can remove the stress people feel who have poor savings and might have an injury or a, a surgery that will wipe out their savings or find out that their kids can't go to college because it's too expensive. So more Americans I notice are young Americans are thinking that increasingly um, we wanna pay more in taxes if the taxes are used right for education and health. So we get these terrible, awful things stopping us from growing and being happy and so on. That the Nordic way is really the, is where capitalism should be going, the Nordic way. Okay, so um, we are, are, we're very proud of the H2H emphasis on people and, and the fundamentals of, which I define in my book called Advancing the Common Good. The common good is 
how many people are made better off by something and how many are hurt by that something. And if more people are made better off by that decision, then the number of people unhappy do it. It's the right decision. And don't ask who is being happier and who's being sadder, just in sheer numbers. When you're voting on something, the best decision is utilitarian. What maximizes the utilitarian value? Uh, the amount of happiness and, 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 and uh, uh, of people. And that goes back to Jeremy Bentham in England in the 1780s, same time Adam Smith was writing, same time. So I've gone maybe off course in sharing some of my thinking about the background of marketing before we got to, you know, Peter Drucker started a lot of thinking. He's the grandfather of marketing. He not only said the purpose of a company is to create a customer, but he said that the two most important functions in the business are one, innovation, and two, the ability to market that innovation. Innovation and marketing. And he said, as an insult to the CEOs at the time, the other functions are just costs. Production is just the cost, finance is just the cost. But if you can manage those two, innovation and marketing, uh, you've got it made. And I, I recently wrote a book, uh, co-authored it with the CEO of, uh, of uh, Fujifilm. Fujifilm is still operating as a company. Kodak is dead. What happens to a company when it loses its market? Everything, it dies, not Fujifilm. CEO Kamari, who ran Fujifilm, said, we have thousands of secrets in our business that we can, we never had time to do it, anything with them because we had to just make and sell film. Money was easy. Now we went into all the secrets on how you make even color film, 14 steps to make color film. Each one would be a treasured way to start some other business. And now Fujifilm is bigger than it used to be. So we wrote, we, and, and the premise of the reason it was Komari and I as the authors is Komari represents innovative thinking. And I represent the marketing because again, as Drucker said, those two can save a firm and make a firm. All right, let me stop now and say, India is a dear country to me. I respect its people. I know uh, on our own uh, uh, faculty, we have uh, Mohan Sawney, we have Krishnamurthy, we have very distinguished marketers from India throughout the US. And um, they are distinct, and we know the distinguished marketers in, in India, like yourselves. So we are learning from each other. And thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to participate. And we'll, I hope we can hear from uh, uh, Professor Sponholz more, more, more about H2H now that I've had my chance to share these impressions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kotler. <clears throat> I think uh, we all wanted to hear more and more from you and definitely uh, we would like to you know, learn about H2H marketing. And particularly when you mentioned about creating an ecosystem of marketing, that is something which is very, very crucial. And uh, when you are integrating the neural science with the ecosystem and the newer technologies like AR, VR, 5D kind of thing, it makes a lot of sense that we are merging the traditional uh, marketing with the modern marketing kind of thing. Yes. So thank, thank you, you very much, sir. Thank you very much for all your, uh, in, in India, we call it Gyan and all the concepts which you have shared with us and you're added to it further. And now we move on to uh, Professor Uwe and uh, I'm pronouncing Professor Uwe because it's much easy to say, sir, uh, <laughs> for me. And uh, uh, and definitely, I like to you know give an introduction of Professor Uwe. Uh, Professor Uwe, I think uh, you are now able. To, all of you are must be able to see the screen. 
of Professor Owe. Professor Owe is uh, the Faculty of Business and Engineering, University of Applied Sciences, Wurzburg. I, I, I leave this, uh, you know, I'll try to pronounce it. Schwenfurt, Germany. Okay. Okay. So Professor Owe is a professor of service engineering, innovation and management and uh, design thinking, B2B marketing and sales, as well as strategic management at FHWS and uh, University of Applied Sciences. He also teaches at Christ University, Bangalore, India, and other universities. As a Dean of Faculty of Business and Engineering at FHWS, he was a strategic driver of the internationalization of the university and introduction of innovative teaching methods. Today, in addition to his teaching duties, he is responsible for a degree program management of the MBS business with Europe and the management of two laboratories, Creative Cube and VR Laboratories. So for years, he has supported companies with design thinking workshops and consulting projects. He's also a shareholder and founding partner of Insighto Management Consulting and Body Stance GmbH. He uses a second company to test his conceptual ideas of H2H marketing, friends. So Professor Owe, uh, bring out some of the lab concepts of your design thinking to all the participants. Let me share with you, we have almost 1,000 participants on uh, Zoom here, which is across the, the limit, and there are about two to 300 participants on YouTube also. Everybody asking lots and lots of questions on the modern marketing and the traditional marketing. Over to Dr. Owe, Professor Owe. Uh, okay, I will, I'm so sorry. I, I hope you can unmute yourself, please. Okay, so can you hear me now? Loud and clear, sir. Well, first I have to start, I mean, uh, when we look at the number of participants, okay, I'm a bit afraid that the number will decrease because uh, my godfather of marketing already made his speech. I must say this to you, Phil, when I was a student, and uh, I don't know if you see it, I'm 56 years now, and I'm still in touch with my um, PhD um, mentor, which is Professor Miller Hagedon. And I wrote him a letter some weeks ago, and I told him that I, I had the honor and the chance to publish together with Phil Kotler. And I told him the story how I developed to a, get an assistant at his uh, marketing and sales department and then he said you actually it was not me it was phil who uh, already put the bacteria or the virus in me which drives me since decades and um, since decades i personally have the the wish and the drive to uh, write down and tell the community as well as in practice as well as in theory to say, hey, please wake up, listen, listen, listen. And that's something what I learned from design thinking. So um, thank you. I, yeah, and, and you are so right. It's time that we fuse the basic messages of brand activism and H2H &H marketing. And we are not the only ones who are announcing this message now. Um, and there are more and more companies who are practicing partly at least H to H marketing. So let me share some basic ideas, but the host has to allow me to share my screen. I'm doing right away, sir. <laughs> Done. Mm, done. Okay, wait a minute. Just have to find it. Uh, while uh, Professor Uwe is uh, sharing his screen, I must share, friends, uh, there is going to be a very interesting Q&A session after this uh, session. So you may post your questions in the chat box for that. Thank you. Back to Professor Uwe, please. Uh, what happened? Well, that's uh, digitalization happened. Yeah, that's right. Can, can you hear me again? We can hear you, but uh, I think your screen has gone away. Uh, Shripath, can you just look into and put him in the spotlight, please, once again? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I, we are, you are back. You know, like Thank you very much. You are back, sir. 
So let's try it again. It was the screen sharing. Okay. So can you see the screen? Absolutely. Yeah. Fine. So H -H. let's see H to H marketing though. First of all, as uh, Phil Kotler already mentioned, I mean, he was the first time in 1955, right, Phil? You were the first yes. time with your wife in, in India. I mean, I even was not born at that time. So <laughs> that means everything to me. But since 2008, I spent a lot of time in India. Only coronavirus stopped me for the last one and a half years. And uh, I hope I will be back soon. And... I'm, I'm always quite confused uh, when I walk on the streets and I ask um, in Mumbai, can you tell me where is that and that in Mumbai? The people say it's Bombay. When I say, can you tell me please where is that and that in Bombay? They say it's Mumbai. So um, I hope uh, I'm right when I address both words. Okay, so it's Bombay and it's Mumbai and I'm so happy to be with you. And um, only some minutes ago, I asked who is the target audience? That should be always the first question of a marketer and so i got to know it's a, a very different kind of corporates here and um coming from the title of uh, bombay management association one can ask why should we listen to marketing because we are here for management and i want to tell you that um h to h marketing is more than marketing on an operational level it deals also with management and um, this is something what I want to focus on so that you can take it out maybe for you, that you ask yourself what we are doing as corporates uh, on different management functions and levels with the H2H -H marketing. Okay, so shortly I will introduce you the story and the model. Um, Valdemar already made a lot of uh, input to the model, so I try to abbreviate it to make it short as possible and to add things which I um, heard from Phil, okay? So we have two things. There is um, there's the story of H2H -H marketing and there is H2H -H marketing as a story. In the beginning, you asked, what uh, does H2H -H marketing has to do with the storytelling or design thinking and so on? And I put a four on each and every scale. And it also has to do with storytelling because Waldemar and me firstly, and then Phil, we try to write the book as a story. So, and this is something what I want to share with you. So um, the story, oh, sorry, the story of the genesis of H2H -H marketing, as you might see, happened in India. And I was so happy that I could spend eight months on the campuses of uh, Christ uh, deemed to be university in Bangalore. And why Bangalore, or India is such a nice place to develop such a concept and uh, approach is because, guess, why do you think India is one of the best places to think about modern concepts? And please put it in the chat or anywhere where you can communicate. I want to make it more interactive. And I tell you, for me, it was because I can see every human problem in India. I cannot see it in Germany. We are living in a bubble. So actually, I 100% agree with Phil when he was critical with Richard Branson. I mean, why we are using so much money, resources and energy to make some very rich people happy, happy when we have the bottom of the pyramid. And the bottom of the pyramid is maybe that what Phil means with the common goods, right? The common good is something what we have to put in into our mindset, in our thinking, in our feeling. And uh, so that's something what I want to share with you that of course, what you see in the pictures is only a short summary of uh, things happened over there in Bangalore. And if you look on the image on the right bottom, you will see Waldemar as I love him. Huh? Waldemar, very colorful and a very important festival in India. You know it. And um, that's something what he expressed. Okay, uh, humans want to be happy. And I, I take this happiness from Denmark and Finland and Norway. And uh, that's something what we have to develop on. 
I mean, I don't know if you um, know the book of a Swedish guy, and it's uh, the book is called Factfulness. And in the book, there is a, a proof that um, it, it's done. It's an empirical research in the United States. When you have reached a salary of $70,000 a year, every dollar you earn more makes you unhappier. Okay? So, so when we take this and say, listen, there is a natural balance in us. So, but it's also a human drive. We want to have more, 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 faster, more. And uh, so finally, what we don't listen is our inner apps, okay? And our inner apps are telling us there's something different, what we want. And I learned so much from my Indian friends here, okay? And that's something what has to be merged. So we have a lot of Eastern-oriented philosophies uh, merging with the Western philosophies, and we should not blindly all only follow the Western world okay and that's also something what happened in the last decades so let me share the h to h marketing story so h to h marketing as a story as a very good story follows the uh, following theme we have a call for adventure we have a great journey we have a brave action and we have a solution and return so um, and we tried to write the book in, in that manner. And so we said, listen, the call for adventure is the current state of marketing. And um, Valdemar as well as Phil have talked about the need, the, urgent, the urgency that we have to do something here, right? So, and what you can find in the book is the uh, current state of marketing. And I definitely think that in the second edition, we will have um, things like uh, what is the demand for CEO today in such a troubled world? And uh, we go on with sustainable management challenge, the evolution of H to H marketing. Then we step into the great journey, which is which is for us the new marketing paradigm, H to H marketing. And as you already learned, we have design thinking, service dominant logic, and digitalization as big big influencing factors. What conceptually what has let us to develop H2H -H marketing as an approach. On the same time, what we did was we analyzed the marketing in practice. So it's not enough to look for new ideas in the concepts because very often you can observe things in the field, means in the companies, which is already ahead of the concepts and vice versa. So this, what you see is the conceptual um, ideas behind the H2H -H marketing and then we came to uh, our brave action, which is um, the components of H2H -H marketing. And we differentiate H2H -H mindset, management, and process. I will come back to this later on. And then finally, we have the solution in return. And for, for us, that's exactly what Waldemar and uh, especially Phil are uh, emphasizing. We have to find a meaning in our troubled world again. And that's not only a society, that's not only a nation, a national, it's also an individual task and uh, all are interconnected and that's um, really new. So we thought about world wakes up, future in resonance and we have to find meaning again. So that's the story in the book. So when you open the book and you will read it chapter by chapter, you can follow the circle from left to right. But of course you also can walk into the different chapters if you want to abbreviate and you are especially interested in the operational process of marketing, of H2H -H marketing, you can start in a, in, a later, in a later chapter. So H2H -H marketing itself, as I told you, has uh, two layers. First layer is the impacting concepts. And what we mean with impacting concepts is Design thinking, what we can take out, uh, Waldemar already made the hint, but it's very important for me to get, um, to get an impression of the audience. I know that it's very popular, design thinking outside in the world. I'm practicing it since more than 10 years and I'm a fascinated design thinker, I'm, but I'm also a marketing thinker. So this was something what 
has uh, driven me. And I asked in design thinking projects, I asked myself, what kind of competences should we add from a marketer that we need in innovation projects? And um, more and more, it was clear for me that our approach is not only a marketing approach, it's also a management approach for transformation. So nearly every company today has to transform its business. And I and Waldemar and Phil, we are looking forward to support companies in that situation in a way that we say, and marketing can contribute to this transformation by using it on each and every management level. You can use it on the top management level, but on the top management level, we are mainly uh, talking about normative marketing uh, management. And normative management means we have to ask ourselves as a top management, what is the mindset we and our people should have to serve our customers and other humans means other partners the best in our ecosystem. And design thinking taught me, I mean, I participated and I made a lot of trainings of uh, corporates in design thinking. And what I observed is a lot of people outside think that they can make a design thinking management training or something like that for two days, three days workshops, and then they return back in the companies and they know what design thinking is. No, sorry. That's maybe the method, that's maybe the tools which we used in the, in the workshops, but it's not the philosophy, it's not the mindset. So we have to work hardly on the mindset. And the same happened on the service dominant logic. I mean, lucky India, you are already very services oriented. I mean, I don't know who of you spend some days in Germany, but maybe you will be get confronted with a very good dominant logic still. Um, we celebrate the services dominant logic, but services is not enough. So service in the sense of service dominant logic means the application of knowledge and capabilities in the favor of a beneficiary. And that's something what drives also the value system of a company again. So the same happens with digitalization. Digitalization is not only a digitalization of communication. Digitalization is a transformation of how to do business. Uh, it is a transformation of what is in our value proposition. So altogether, these three impacting and influencing factors or concepts have driven us to um, develop the second layer. And the second layer consists out of mindset, which is a top management task, which doesn't mean that you have to work with your people in the whole corporation and with your partners and everybody in the ecosystem on the mindset, but it means that you have to have a certain idea, a concept which you communicate with your people and you allow that they practice, practice it later on and um, that you have also some tensions. So it, it, there must be space that somebody agrees or disagrees. Okay, and that's the top management level. And then we come to the marketing management level, which is H2H uh, management and later on to the operational process, which is uh, our H2H process. So on the mindset level, I don't want to repeat what uh, um, Waldemar already has shown. We never should forget the me. And in the me, the mindset has to be mindful, first of all, because it, before it can be open to others. So that means when I want to abbreviate it, we have to train people and we have to give them a chance to get the innerpreneur. That's really something what is uh, in me. I, I have to be an innerpreneur before I can get an entrepreneur or entrepreneur. And then I, before I can listen to others, before I can understand them, I must understand myself. And so both is necessary. And of course, the last circle is that what already was mentioned, it's the ecosystem. So everything is embedded in the ecosystem. And the ecosystem, the largest one we have in the moment is our planet. And, uh, but it's also societies. Finally, it's humans. And uh, so um, what we want to get rid of is that we only think uh, about the customers. So there are much more humans. There are my employees, there are the partners. And I always have to raise the question, the magical question, why? So not the how, which is a very 
I mean, close to engineering. Um, it's really the, the why, what we have to ask. Otherwise, I cannot give meaning to the ecosystem and to my others and to me. Well, on the management, what we see is that in the center, we have the, really, that's for me a key performance indicator. We have to create trust and to stabilize trust. And so we differentiate three management concepts which are contributing to that and you have to coordinate them. So you have to work on your customer experience. You have to work on the reputation of your corporation or brand. And you have, of course, you have to work on the brand. All three of them will ensure that you can survive in a transformation in the ecosystem, your company or corporation is embedded. And the last one is the process. And the process is very similar from the outlook and the feeling uh, on uh, quite a lot of design thinking processes, of course, because that's what I learned in design thinking projects and Waldemar and Phil. What we see is it's, it is iterative. So that means you might start with value proposition because you already know what kind of human problem you are solving, you try to solve. You already gain deep insights, either by data-driven approaches or ethnographic approaches. So e both is uh, very necessary that you have social media listening, for example, that you can use it, right? Um, I, I used, for example, social media listening for Bombay Management Association. If you're interested, I can show you. So um, it's interesting to see what people talk about me, talk mm. about company, right? And um, so we can gain deep insights by make it really digital and data driven. But on, this, on the other hand, I have to do it very qualitative. I have to go in the field. I have to observe. I have to interview to really dig into the people. Okay. Then value proposition, of course. Um, Maybe for you it's clear, but what I see in the companies when you ask them what is your value proposition, they think in products still, and they think in services, but they don't think in value propositions. And that's something what has to do also with the mindset. I cannot create value. It is in the hands of the main creator of value, and that's the user slash customer slash client. I don't like the word consumer because consumer means destroyer by destroying by consumption and that's something what we should get rid of and then of course the content um, you all know what is content marketing in the moment but take care with this word when you translate it into my language it has very different meanings it means it means also don't disturb and a lot of content marketing disturbs. So we have a contradiction here. You want to create awareness, but you don't want to disturb people. So that's really critical. That's really difficult. And of course, the same is true. We are not talking anymore about distribution or something like that. Now we want to allow our ecosystem to get in connection with us. So we have to create access channels for them. Well, and everything is connected with the management approach, but also with the engineering and we also with the business model and the business case. So that's the process. Yeah. And um, HH knowledge and practice means that we have a German book, which is not relevant for you maybe, but we have our book together with uh, Phil. And uh, we also have a blog, which is called uh, www.mensch.marketing and you can see it there in English. And uh, what we do is we interview people there. Sometimes we have podcasts, everything what keeps us updated uh, uh, everything in the environment of H2H uh, marketing. Let me, let me take the words of Phil and say, um, just want to stop it here. Let me take the words, um, and it still drives me. What exactly is the core competency of marketers? What exactly is it? And the past answers are very atomistic. So some of you are expertizing content marketing. Some are making digital marketing. Some of you are talking about guerrilla marketing or whatever. So we have a lot of buzzwords. And, um, but when you ask in top management, what is the contribution of manage, uh, marketing to management? 
and the contribution to your company, very often it's reduced to mark, uh, publication communication or something like that. And I should, we should ask us again the magical question, why is it love? Why is it so? And to be honest with you, we have so much new tools, methods to understand why humans behave like they behave, that we have to regain our competences exactly here. I mean, I know it's a hard field, neuroscience, huh, Phil. We know that. It's a hard field to understand how the brain works. Of course, it's a hard field to understand why our machine is differentiating in primary and secondary machines, right? The primary machines are... My, my wonderful first question to my audience very often is, why do we have a brain? What's your answer? I'm really curious. What's your answer? Why do we have a brain? Hmm. Thank you. To feel, okay. To think. Yeah, to operate. To think and execute. Thank you very much. That's the normal answer is really to think. Sorry, sorry, sorry. The main task of our brain, since we are uh, able to walk uh, upright through the prairies, right, is to survive. That's the main task of our brain. And when we respect this, and we know that our brain cons consumes more than one third of the energy of our body, every day and that when we are using slow thinking as our colleague daniel kahneman is telling us when we use slow thinking our, our brain still consumes up to half of the energy consumption of the whole body a day and our our body tries to protect us okay our brain tries to protect so we have this immediate spontaneous kind of thinking right we we make decisions unconscious and emotionally. And it is in the B2B world still an, a nightmare to see how many people think that we are deciding rational. We are deciding emotional and unconscious, but we argue and discuss later on with our buying center, rational. So that's something what is very important also for our ecosystem discussion. So when I go out of my door or I go out here, right? I don't feel, my brain doesn't feel any fear. It doesn't feel any danger. So when I go out in New Delhi some days, right? I can't breathe. My brain immediately identifies there is danger for me. And then the link between an information that we have to be more conscious, that we have to be more sustainable has much more impact than here in Germany. I know it's burning in the United States right now, Phil, isn't it? It's very hot. And that's the moments where people start thinking. And we can use it as marketers when we know that the brain needs this kind of response from the environment, that we really understand that when we do something for the planet, for the common good, then we are getting the people. So let's use marketing for exactly this task, right? First help the companies to transform their business. It's not only IT. It's not only production. It is also marketing, which we should and must use to handle this transformation. Every company is undergoing now. And the second thing is let, let's use marketing also to make people conscious and aware, which is hard enough because slow thinking is not popular. Um, to make it on the first fast thinking mode clear for us, our brain, that we have to change. We have to do something. It's not profit. Profit will come from, you know, Phil, I, I, I tried to cite you, right? Last time you said, listen, companies like Unilever, they already understood that the main stakeholder is not the shareholder. It, it is only number seven in their stakeholder group, right? I, I love this, right? Phil, I love this because this put us to the position to tell our, and in a shareholder meeting, I can tell this, and that was really brave. Tell the shareholders, you are not number one, you are number seven. And if we have made 
our other stakeholders in our ecosystem happy, you will get your profit, but not otherwise, not vice versa. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope we have a lot of discussion. Thank you. Wow, great. I think the last point has just stuck with us that shareholder is number seven. So stay there. So if we do the things right, we, we function on the value propositions. And of course, we build trust. And of course, we follow the model. We definitely will give you the shareholders value accordingly. That's great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Owe. And uh, I think uh, I think one of the best uh, evenings in India we have spent over here. We are blessed to have the three brains and led by Dr. Philip Portler, Professor Philip Portler with us. Yeah, now we have uh, lots of questions, sir, but we will not be asking all these questions, but uh, we, we have selected questions. And for that, I am inviting uh, Mrs. Chaya Sehgal. She is the past president of Bombay Management Association, and uh, she is a leading entrepreneur in Mumbai, and of course, a leading management thinker and thought leader also. So with this, I request uh, Chaya ma'am to come forward. But before that, I would like to make an appeal to all the participants. If you are not a member of Bombay Management Association, please do become and benefit from the sessions like this. Every Wednesday and every Friday, we have these sessions. And the cost of membership is less than a pizza. Let me share with you. Less than a pizza. If you can afford to improve yourself by you know, spending less than a pizza, please contact Bombay Management Association. Over to Chaya Ma'am. Thank you, Jagmohan. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning to the audience in this Wednesday Wisdom webinar of Bombay Management Association's Masterclass on Human to Human Marketing. Once again, a warm welcome to the stalwarts and marketing gurus, Professor Kotler, Professor Waldemar, Professor Owe, our former presidents, Dr. Kavita Laghate, and executive committee members, office bearers, and members of BMA. Leaders and management professionals, educators and students who have joined in today and my colleagues from the academics. A big thank you for the privilege to conduct this Q&A session after an hour long, insightful, inspiring and thought provoking masterclass. It's an honor to share the dais with the legend whose book marketing management we studied almost four decades back when we entered the classroom to earn our master's degree in management. It's a dream come true today for us to be tutored on H2H marketing by the guru himself. As I was listening over the last one hour, I was struck by a realization that the more we rely on technology, especially in today's highly digitized marketing era, where bots, artificial intelligence, and other forms of machine learning prevail, more we move away from this awareness that behind every business consumer or the destroyer in Dr. Uwe's words, nonprofit or government body, there is a living, breathing human being who's making decisions. However, more than ever, implementing that human element can be a huge differentiator for businesses in the crowded and often impersonalized online spaces. This pandemic has shown us the need for irreplaceable human touch and presence in our lives. As much as the blessing of technological enablement in supporting our daily routine while we were forced to stay within the four walls of home. Although H2H is more of a blanket term that can be applied across the board and better yet is likely to touch on many of the marketing strategies that many of us have practiced and have been practicing. In today's circumstances, H2H marketing becomes even more relevant since humanizing of marketing builds trust. It taps into people's emotions and research shows that this is one of the most important elements in the decision-making process of the buyer's journey. There are numerous such reflections posted in the chat box by our discerning audience and also the umpteen questions. So without further ado, let me dive into the much awaited Q&A session to get the most from these precious 15, 20 minutes that we have on hand. Uh, the first question comes from Professor M.K. Chauhan, who's our former president. He says to Professor Philip Kotler and the team, sir, extremely grateful for your novel H2H marketing paradigm. 
considering the fact that sustainability and SDGs have taken center stage in the world, product responsibility will become extremely important. How will the brand marketing change? How CEOs and CMOs rethink this aspect? Over to the learned panel. Uh, Professor Kotler, would you like to take it forward, sir? Yes. Um, I think that companies um, have to be aware that they're going to be judged by a lot of things, including tr the level of trust of the company. And I want to say something about that uh, because a study was recently done by the Edelman company, which is called, he has a barometer called the Edelman Trust Barometer. And the surprising news is that in the past, the most trusted segment of society, at least in the US and Europe, were nonprofit organizations. Why? Because they're not for profit, so they're not guided by profit making. And they also often have a very good cause, uh, curing cancer, uh, teaching better education, and so on and so forth. But, and, and that the lowest trust was in media. The lowest trust is in the media segment of the market. And that's a, a very pronounced in the United States because you've got no, you don't have objective newspapers anymore. You have Fox, which is always the Republican and the extreme Republican view. And you've got the New York Times, which is more democratic. So we're not getting unadulterated news, we're getting opinion news. And maybe India is seeing that too. Uh, but now government's level of trust was high. Uh, it's gone up and down over time trusting your government or the local government, let's say the mayor or the, the governor and so on. But the highest now, this is the finding that really caught my attention is business is the most trusted now, even more than nonprofit. I don't know if that's the case in India or certain businesses are highly trusted, but the thing is, that we are relying increasingly on businesses to define the public good, the public good. And they're doing it by making statements that, um, like Larry Fink uh, is well known. He runs a very big fund. I don't know if it's a hedge fund or what, but he says businesses new responsibility is to make sure the society works better. And that's a very profound idea. You know, if you let more of the wealth go to fewer and fewer people, that is suicidal for business. It's suicide, leaving no money for people to buy Coca-Cola or whatever else they want to buy. Well, so business has a strong interest in making sure that as wealth is generated, it's distributed fairly in the hands of the common folk to have the money to buy the things that business is making. And every uh, billionaire has to worry, should worry about keeping money out of the market in a sense, just in some stocks and bonds and real estate and big mansions and airplanes and all that. Okay, so if businesses, if we're relying on business more, each business that's listening to this, have you measured the level of trust in your business procedures and how it's been contributed to by your branding work, your reputation activities? And, and then that thing that was stated earlier by Yule about the three or four ingredients. So I don't know if I'm answering the question you asked. I thought it was a good question, but I want to just say that businesses in the 
game of, of transformation and the need for transformation have, have to take a more high-minded view of what they're about, what they want to create. Now, my definition of marketing has always been this. Marketing is the art and science of creating this creating, communicating, and delivering value to a target market for a profit, which may take different forms. Profit could take different forms. As a matter of fact, let's get back to this one point that about the shareholder being number seven. The question is, is that if we made share holder number one, will he make more, will that company make more money for the shareholder than if we made the shareholder number seven? And our answer is just read the book, for example, called um, uh, 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 The Deer, what, what is that called? Um, the, the book was written uh, about 25 companies that are the most loved Firm, by America. Firms of Endearment. Firms of Endearment. And firms of endearment are all stakeholder oriented. The reason they are so dear to their employees, they're the suppliers, distributors, and the consumers, is they think st stakeholder, not shareholder. And it makes the shareholder richer than if the shareholder had been the focus. Now, that is a debated point, but we have the evidence to prove that. So you, every company here has to take, buy into stakeholder capitalism, not shareholder capitalism. Okay. Maybe my colleagues have more to say too about the question asked or any other questions. Thank you, sir. Waldemar first. Well, I mean, uh, the question about product responsibility is clearly connected to the question of why. That was Phil also said, the cause oriented. Why I'm here, why do I serve, what is the effect and stuff like that. And um, the HDH approach said that first. It's built on what Phil just mentioned, the firms of endearment concept. We don't have yet the measurements, what they have established, but we know um, the stakeholder approach is the more valid approach. Number one, it incorporates more people of the network, more people of the ecosystem. Number two, it has a clear target. They want to serve the people. And therefore, companies who do that are doing a great job. I mean, when you look at companies like Amazon, they're doing a great job serving um, the clients, fast, quick, anything what they want, but the relationship to the supplier is not that great. So they're missing out at some of the aspects. Um, they also don't have the high profitability what uh, Apple and Microsoft has. Well, they are missing out on something else. So what we are actually thinking is, if you look at the shareholder, uh, the stakeholder approach, you are covering more aspects. And I like the Unilever example because the Unilever company was a, share, a, stake, a shareholder oriented company and they changed. And that change could happen to each and every company. And I think in an environment like India, more and more companies can actually adapt the concept and probably even faster than in America or in Europe. So I think there's a great opportunity. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Roy, would you like to add on? Yeah, oh, wait a minute, sorry. Uh, wrong application. Hmm. Well, I don't know if it works, but let's try. It's a spontaneous idea. Coming on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see my iPad? Oh, sorry for uh, the... Yeah, it's come now. Sorry for the promotion. So can we ask ourselves what is... When we say instead of product development, when we say it's value proposition development. And, and I, I only think, I, I know that there are much more functions involved in an in a good innovation, okay? But when we ask, what exactly is the contribution of engineering? What is the contribution of design? And what is the contribution of marketing to a value proposition development? So can we please together 
ask the magical three questions. Who delivers which question or answers to which question? So for me, engineering is clearly dominated by which question? Audience, please help me. Is it what, is it how, or is it why? What? Okay. We make a guess, okay? The what for me is here. Okay. What we want to develop is the value proposition itself. For me, it's clearly how, even for the design, it's clearly the how which wow. is dominating, but the why should be here. Okay, so we contribute, of course, to design and to engineering by delivering always the message why. So why is this linked to brand management? Because when we, our, when we don't link our brand to the purpose, the answer of the why, we will not create a valuable brand, not anymore. So the brand is really our link between down to earth operational development of an, an value proposition and the purpose of the company slash brand. So it, it doesn't make any sense to talk about value proposition when there is no value in. And uh, the Dutes law tells us that value is equal why divided through how. And we are living in a how dominated world, okay? We are not living in a why dominated world in innovation sector. And that's why we desperately need marketing again to tell us why we need this kind of engineering, why we need this kind of design of a value proposition. That's from my, my answer. Thank you, sir. So yes, uh, moving on from shareholders, uh, capital to stakeholders return to even actually responsible capitalism seems to be the answer where every why can be answered as to why something has to be consumed. Because as Professor Uwe pointed out, if consumption is akin to destruction, then the first question has to be why should we consume it at all? And if there is a good answer for that, which covers everybody around us and which is good for everyone in terms of value creation and when everybody derives value, whether it is society, whether it is environment, whether it is our other stakeholders, then the things begin. And that is when the marketing and everyone will be in sync. So the CEO, the CMO, the CFO, the COOs, the consumers and the shareholders will be happy and this planet will smile at us. So thank you, sir. Thank you for that beautiful answer. Uh, next question that comes uh, to us is from our immediate past president, Professor RSS Mani. He asks how to inculcate a culture of ethical marketing and advertising standards by companies. So any company that um, deviates from being ethical is exposing all of its people to great risk because we have fortunately journalists and others who are looking for misbehavior and they will report it. And that can kill a company that is loose in its ethics. Look at what happens in the United States with, with, with a company that is selling a drug uh, that is addictive, it, it's for, helping you feel a little better, but it's addictive and they're making billions out of selling the drug and had no squat, no qualms about it. No, uh, and now they're being sued to get back money that they accumulated from misleading and abusing uh, people's needs and so on. So uh, ethics should be, ethics start at the top, I suppose. If the, and if the, if the top doesn't make a big thing, I, when I work with IBM, one of the wonderful things about IBM is ethics were extremely important to them. And they communicated that to every one of their employees to make the right decision for the customer, not the right decision for IBM. If there's a conflict, make it for the customer. 
and so on. Um, so I, I'd like to hear my, my colleagues about what their experience is in noticing ethical or maybe unethical behavior in companies and what they think about it. Well, from my perspective, I think the time of the unethical behavior is almost done. I mean, we have seen really bad things happening over the last 50 years. But I think through due to the transparency, due to uh, uh, customer involvement through the digital communication, the possibilities to unearth these kind of things are much higher. Nevertheless, we have a um, new type of capitalism, which uh, is uh, uh, through high tech, uh, large companies who are ruling major parts of the world. So there is a new challenge coming up and we need to find out how we can deal with that. I mean, many small and medium sized companies are getting under because of the dominance of the uh, big five internet companies. And therefore there's a new challenge and we need to deal with that. So far, I think there is no solution. Governments are struggling. Um, the European Union is um, not effective for dealing with the Chinese or, and the American companies. So, I mean, there's a big challenge ahead. Nevertheless, the consumers have a big opportunity. And uh, if we train management, with the thinking what we are proposing in the age to age marketing, there could be a counterbalance. So far, I see only the challenge. If somebody can help, it would be great. Thank you, sir. Professor Uwe, would you like to add on? Well, in case we know why humans behave like they behave, we really enjoy to have a lot of power in our hands. Okay? So then I really can manipulate people humans and so now on the second layer we have this ethical question so how should we use this power and um sorry again it's it's not only a corporation uh, a corporate task it's not only an individual task it's also a societal task i mean when you read the book um, brand activism of uh, the colleagues um Kotler and what's his name, Sakar? Uh, Christian. Christian, Christian Sakar. Christian Sakar. Then they announced that in the Edel Edelman Trust Barometer, it's clearly uh, stated that um, we don't have trust anchors anymore. Okay, so before it was politics um, and uh, nonprofit organizations and media and in a certain part of the companies and uh, the first three have lost, uh, they are not anymore our trust anchors. So we need us, I mean companies, and I mean also my company Body Stance, we need to use this power to build trust, right? Um, but we cannot rest on it. We should shift the power back to the politics again, okay, to the societies and in my own company, we have four shareholders and two of us are, I would say, already um, ecosystem oriented and the other ones are profit oriented. And so every day, nearly every day, we have this clash, okay? Every day they are coming, but we have to sell. And I said, but we want to use, I mean, the money, of course we earn money and we want to use it to build up a thought leadership in, uh, in body stands, right? In posture. Uh, and this consumes money, of course, um, and it needs money and resources and energy, fine. But in nearly every day we have this clash. And if you really have a stance and you need a stance, and I mean really on the top level, you need the stance to say, no, I know that in the long term we will be punished from the crowd, right? And we don't know the crowd, um, that's new. Uh, we will be punished by the crowd and our profits will go down anyway. So that's for me a very difficult day-by-day -day task to convince my shareholders that uh, it it's makes no sense to look only on the short term to have better sales. That's not has nothing to do with ethics and ethics is definitely related to human problems of our planet. That's my answer. Thank you, sir. So yes, just as the culture flows from the top, the ethics also will come from the top. 
And uh, as uh, Professor Valdemar said, that time for the unethical uh, companies is now over. So we hope that when we are mindful of these two facts together, we also build something which is ethical and we automatically thereby discover the models for marketing and advertising which are ethical in nature. I mean, just like we talk about Unilever out there, we can talk about Tata's over here, the kind of trust people have in these companies is precisely because of their ethical conduct. And I think that gives a big lesson for everyone else who's in the same space and uh, who is building or emol uh, you know, emoluting these uh, companies. So yes, uh, let us move. Sir, if I have your permission, may I continue with a couple of more questions? It's 8, uh, 36, 20, 36 at our end. Yes. Do we? Thank can, you. can I make one proposal? Because yes. we made it already once. Can you can you gather all questions? Yes. And can you document them and send Phil, Waldemar, and me the questions? Yes. And we three of us we try to build affinity diagrams, which is a design thinking routine. Sure. To build groups, and because that would be a wonderful fundament for us to develop further on. And so, and, and then you might have a chance to give us another platform where we can communicate our answers to these clusters. Well, that, that'll be wonderful to continue this uh, series of uh, masterclasses. But what do we do right now, sir? May I take on one more question or you? Yes, we'll take yes, one more. Okay, for me. Yeah, all right. So I continue with one more question. Uh, this question comes uh, from uh, Professor Arun Saigal. Uh, for years, brands have focused on creating consumer connect for building brand loyalty so that we get an ever-growing population of repeat users. This was never possible without human-to-human -human marketing earlier too. So today when we, when we see the digital tech and AI being used to attract the consumers more than ever, what is the new perspective of H2H marketing that one should reckon with and practice since retention will need and has always needed a sensitive human touch? Uh, Professor Kotler, would you like to answer that? Uh, yes, you're raising a question about what's happening to, to loyalty um, in this fast changing world. And uh, no, no one can really uh, depend anymore on buyers repeatedly buying from us out of something called loyalty. They'll continue to buy uh, out of us if they have trust and good experience. Uh, and it turns out that, that, that they have to, um, a, a company, we u used to use the term high tech and high touch. Uh, that was de developed by one of our good futurists uh, in his thinking uh, when he wrote, and I forget his name, but Let's go back to high tech and high touch. Uh, if, if a company only uses one of those and is poor at the other, there's a real problem. Uh, a company that is high, tuck, high uh, tech and has automation throughout, using machines rather than people, being super efficient in that way is not likely to hold on to its employees uh, and others, unless the pay is so good that yes, they'll stay with the company, but the consumers will have a kind of a, a feeling they're not, they're living, they're, they're buying from a machine rather than a, a breathing human being. So on the other hand, if all you have is high touch, but you have not done enough high tech work to be efficient, uh, that's not going to keep uh, people happy because the competitors who are doing a combination of high tech and high touch are actually delivering more. So let's uh, say loyalty uh, is in part a matter of managing a ratio of high tech and high touch in the servicing of people. Our aim with any customer really is to get them to become a fan of the company an advocate, um, and there is a measure now that's available 
to answer that question about how many of our customers are actually customer advocates, which means uh, they're super loyal. The question is to the customer, have you ever talked about how good the com our company is to other people? And there's three, an one answer is, oh, all the time. I love the company and I, when I ever have a chance, uh, I, 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 I praise it. That's a, that's a wonderful type of customer. Sometimes they say, I haven't thought of it, but I am happy with the company and the FASC, or maybe even I'll start thinking about telling others. And someone else might say it a little lighter than that. So using those, that data, you can find out if 0% of your customers are really advocates, which is a terrible thing, and you're not gonna have any loyalty, or a large percentage, it's not gonna be super large ever, but a large percentage are your marketers. You see, to be an advocate, it, it, it means that you don't have to spend, you, in the book uh, that I mentioned earlier, um, the, the companies that are very successful spend less in, in, on marketing because much of it is done by their fans, talking to others about the company, which has always much more validity when it's person to person saying something favorable than an ad saying something favorable. So pay attention to uh, getting loyalty through actually creating people who are super happy with your performance. Thank you, Phil, for bringing in this high tech, high touch. I think that's a great way of looking at it. People want to stay with the product and people want to have new things. And sure. if I change the perspective away from the company to the customer, actually the customer wants to be with companies in relationship. They want to have friends. They want to be close to the people, to the companies who are offering them the things what they want. So actually there's one side is the retention, but the other side is I want to be with you. And that is actually a new way when you look from an H to H perspective, the customer wants stable relationships. At the same time, they want innovation. So, I mean, currently we go through uh, the changes in the transition in the car business from combustion uh, engines to electrical engines. Of course, we want to stick with that because the electrical engines are uh, not so noisy, not so polluting, whatever, whatever. Uh, but if a company is not offering that, they can be, can, cannot be loyal. I mean, for years, you couldn't buy an electrical Mercedes because they were not bringing the products out. So you couldn't be loyal because you wanted to have something. So you had to switch to Tesla and other ones. So now the company is finally switching. Now, as a Mercedes user, you can have electrical car too. So actually, the company did not follow the ideas of the customer. So having H to H means also as an understanding the customer more and letting the customer being part of this development and therefore design thinking and therefore service dominant logic. You have the possibility now to switch perspective, not only looking from outside in, you also look from inside out as marketing has changed from outbound marketing to inbound marketing, all this stuff is actually changing the world. And I think we are happy because at the end of the day, we can create something better and hopefully also for the world. Professor Uwe, would you like uh, to I, I love you to say my name. Therefore, I wait until you say Professor Uwe. <laughs> it's such a difficult word for English tongue. Really, yeah. So do I say, say it correctly, sir? Do I well, you say it very correctly. correctly. It's it's Uwe. It's a very, it's an old it's, Nordish name, right. so it's not used anymore. So yeah. even when you when you know that I'm Uwe, you know that I'm quite old. So um, never mind. But that's um, the fundamental of marketing that we must always <laughs> pronounce the name of our customer correctly because that's well, listen, listen, the I, most. You can imagine that I also struggle in India, isn't it? Yes. Yes. So please um, continue, Professor. Yeah, Chaya, right? Yes, sir, Chaya. That's just Chaya. perfect. Yes. Listen, 
I, I completely agree with the high tech, high touch, and I completely agree with we switch the point of view. Okay, again, let's go to the inner entrepreneurship. Okay, let's go and understand ourselves. So I ask you, how do you book your next holidays? How do you do it? Do you still go to the same travel agency? Do you at least use travel agencies or do you go to the internet and say, ah, oh, listen, nice, there are nice hotel, uh, 4.8 stars. We know that 4.4 is the best, okay? We know that already empirically. Don't make 4.8, it's too high. People will not trust you. So let's take the 4.4 and we can manipulate it. Woohoo! So we have a 4.4 stars on reviews. And do you use these reviews? And do you trust that to choose your destination? If you do so, don't ask yourself why we have such a low loyalty. Okay? So it always starts with us humans. And on the same hand, I mean, I love the internet because I have such a global reach with my value proposition I never had before. But first, I also have to understand when I want to keep my users not consumers, when I want to have my users and I want to keep them, I have to first ask myself, what keeps me in relation to a company, a brand, a product, a service? And um, definitely it is something has to do with the service dominant logic. If it is easy to copy, I mean, I can go to how many thousands, millions of hotels worldwide and I can use how many platforms to book my next travel and my holidays. And um, of course, the first, the fast thinking again, uses this review stars uh, to make it very easy not to consume too much energy. And if the rating is fair and, we all, and it's authentic, then we can use it as users as well as a company. So that's what I want to ask you before you challenging companies say is is it really loyalty is it really decreasing ask yourself as a human are you having a decreasing loyalty rate and ask yourself again the magical question yeah. why and if you can respond to it you will find um, a wonderful sharp weapon to increase your business because Thanks. without retention there is no growth thank you thank you that is uh... For a remark, that is a, that is a remark, you know, which we shall remember always and always carry out a search within before we do the research outside. Thank you, Professor, for that enlightening remark. So between this high tech and high touch, uh, I believe uh, what I would say is that the leadership is uh, actually about co-holding, you know, the multiple perspectives uh, together and also having two opposing elements with us and finding a path from within, whether to have control or to let go, whether to go for revenue or to go for value, isn't it? Whether to uh, lead or whether to follow. So yes, for the marketeer also, I think the future path is going to be about finding a direction and giving it to his company about how much high tech we should get versus how much high touch we should get. So thank you very much, sir, for that uh, answer. Uh, what do I do now? Uh, you are my guest. If you want me to wrap up, I wrap up. If you can allow me, I will ask one more question, but I would like to take your permission before I further go on, sir. People can don't we... want it to end, that is for sure. No, I know we will not end the discussion till the next 24 hours. Can we pick <laughs> up uh, Uwe's succession? Did you collect all the uh, uh, questions, put them into a uh, format or whatever and uh, we will answer that over the course of the next days sure uh, sure sure ma'am sure. there's a request uh, maybe you can ask one question which is from a pharmaceutical company which i have asked for it your question should i yes ask? okay yeah. final one final one final one so i am going to do that jagmohan at the cost of my question i am not asking my question i'm going to write to professor for that question. There is this question from Mr. Ambar Mishra, Vice President, Wokhard Limited. He is asking achieving quantum leap in sales revenues in a short span of time for differentiated products is always desirable. 
how to approach this and plan better what would be the three critical success factors which would help in creating new customers i mean this is probably a question for a private consultation unit so we can help him doing that but i think he's raising a question from general uh, importance that uh, of course in today's time it is very important to leap for, for leapfrog forward in a very rapid time i mean this is one way of uh, uh, being successful today and in the internet area many companies have uh, actually outperformed the companies who lived before them we don't have a specific concept to that because um there are various ways of doing it i mean uh, of course the best way is uh, if you have the appropriate government regulation but i think the most important thing we would like to transfer is the more you address the human needs the better you can actually follow through and achieve this and therefore do your pre work before better do the design thinking orient completely to the uh service orientation of the uh, offering and then you end up probably with a digital business model which could make this happen thank you professor thank you uh, thank you jagmohan uh, do i have the permission to wrap up now yes sir. yes ma'am in fact right. it is uh, right. i mean right. thank you very so much let me just uh, let me just wrap phil, it up do, uh, phil do you want to answer first to the question or are we happy that we have not to answer we would love to hear from uh, professor kotla the final comments we are in the core right so we want to have short term success and how can we use h to h marketing absolutely can we? can we so that one last high touch from the guru himself oh, i thought that the uh, question was answered well by uh, waldemar and uh, frankly um looking at at india and and i want to say a couple of things just because you're going to summarize things uh you have some remarkable companies in india i've been personally a follower of tata and it is really a company in a person ratan tata to admire greatly just um the idea of developing a car that is affordable to people so that we know industrial societies need better transportation uh you can get on a bicycle and move around too but a car should be affordable and there was a dream and just the way they run their hotels to such high standards um and then there's other companies that i can mention that are so praiseworthy and that are setting the image of how to be a winner the the, the real problem you have some problems in india one of them is found everywhere in the world and that's called corruption corruption is such a cost to society it's corruption of government officials who have power in in order to get uh, your application done or something done you've got to have leadership in india which says that so no no we do not get bribed we we if we will we will expose people who are bribing and punish them as well as the bribe taker the bribe maker and the bribe taker and um you may some of you may know that i uh was looking for who is running a country in the best possible way who is running who is a great leader what is it to be a great leader of a country well we called it the cockler prize it was a committee and i said how impressed we are with mr modi because he came at a time when india was asleep industrialization was happening in china but not in india and india needed a kick start and in all my lectures in india i always say you're a sleeping tiger wake up 
and Modi woke you up. But then that nomination created a big stir. Mr. Modi is too much of a, uh, too narrow in being human to human. And that is a criticism. I will say, Mr. Modi is distinguishing between Hindus and Muslims and other groups and not welcoming India as a society and a civilization for all who want to be part of it. And I have to look for another leader who is more human to human in, in respecting the great idea of, of people. We're thinking currently of the woman who in, uh, in New Zealand, yeah. she did a marvelous job to help the COVID crisis, to, to get her people to live the right way without a lot of lock-in and this and that, but to wear their masks and get vaccinated. So this is, this is there, any country is gonna be headed by different people over different time and with different opinions that they bring to bear. Um, but we need more great leaders of not only countries, but I'm working very much on mayors, mayors, because the whole economy is there in the city. And we should de have more decentralization, more goodness being done it, by each city you choose to live in. Uh, so I, I look for a lot of things happening in India that are lessons for the rest of us too. Uh, if you can show progress of your companies and your government in conducting the way it conducts its affairs, we'd all be a better world. So thank you for the invitation to share a lot of ideas on H2H and the emphasis being on human to human. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So every good thing comes to an end. And so as I wrap up the spirited Q&A session, I once again thank our elite guest speakers, organizers, and audience for a scintillating masterclass of over almost two hours. Let me part on an optimistic note by wishing that the H2H marketing evolves into marketing 6.0, wherein H2H stands for healthy to happy marketing, just as Professor Kotler spoke right in the beginning. And marketers lead this world towards a sustainable planet by enhancing the six capitals, natural, social, human, relationship, intellectual, and financial in that order of priority. Good night, good evening, and a good day to everyone here. Over to the organizers, please. Thank you very much, Aya, ma'am. Thank you very much, and uh, great uh, Q&A session. And uh, as uh, promised, we will definitely share with you the complete uh, you know, repository of Q&A, and maybe it will turn into a new book of yours. Sir. I would be sending my question by email to the three guests because I could not ask my questions. But as a moderator, it was my responsibility to ask the questions sent out to me before everyone else. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Namaste. Uh, one uh, uh, last thing which will go, go it. Uh, I would like to have a... Uh, Shripad, can you just quickly do a poll, the second poll, uh, which is there, Shripad? Uh, the, it will just take 30 seconds for everybody to appear for the poll. Ripad, you're there. Uh, this is regarding, uh, you know, the H2H marketing book. Uh, and Ripad, you're there. Because I'm not able to run the poll. It's running. It's running. No, it's not for me. For my, it's not. It running. is. It is running. It is running. We are seeing that. Okay. So maybe I'm not able to see because I'm a host. So kindly, uh, uh, you know, punch for the second poll. And uh, then since I'm not able to see the poll, so Shripat, can you please uh, answer what the results are coming over there? There are two questions in the second poll. One is, uh, are you keen on reading H2H marketing? And second question is, would you like to purchase the book on H2H marketing. I 
I think the three authors ought to leave because they okay. don't want to vote. It's not fair for us to vote. <laughs> so thank you very much, so sir. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to take leave now. But thank I've you. just thank you. thoroughly thank you thoroughly enjoyed uh, this. My companions and 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 the sponsors and all your remarks. Thank you very much. Rajesh, so hope to see you soon. We request uh, Mr. Rajesh Sharma from Bombay Management Association to please give his vote of thanks for this speech. Um, thank you, Jack Mohan. And I have the honor of uh, giving the word of thanks for today's event. And we are actually privileged to attend uh, the session with such luminaries, especially Professor Kotler. Um, thanks for sharing the concept of human to human marketing. Uh, uh, we are very thankful for, uh, to you for sharing your rich experiences uh, and newer concepts in, man in marketing with the young and not so young audience of more than 1,000 participants. Uh, we are uh, thankful to Dr. Philip Kotler, Dr. Weldman, uh, Professor Sponhoff, um, uh, and our present president, uh, Ms. Um, uh, uh, you know, Kavita Nagate, uh, and past presidents, Mr. M.D. Agarwal, Mr. Vijay Jalan, Professor RSS Mani, uh, Ms. Shaya Sehgal, Mr. Indrapal Singh, uh, Mr. Anand Singhania, uh, Mr. Ernest Fernandez, Mr. Uh, M.K. Chauhan, and Mr. N.M. Konda for attending this session and my uh, management committee colleagues, all members of management, uh, Bombay Management Association, and all participants from corporates, institutions, and students. And also, I'm thankful to all the BMA working staff for their hard work for making this event successful. And I'll not be, I'll failing my duty in thanking the host, Mr. Jagmohan Singh, for doing a wonderful job. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending this session and um, giving your continued support to BMA in its endeavor to share the educational programs. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everybody. Once again, Dr. Dr. Professor Waldemar, Professor Uwe, thank you very much. And Professor we, Waldemar, thank you, Professor Uwe. We continue Welcome. with that. I hope to see you again. Definitely, yeah. definitely. We'll and have another we'll, master class. We'll have thank another you. one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very I, much, everybody. I, I hope you all are healthy, and uh, I plan to come to India in November, so please stay a little bit distant, but I will have a chance to come to you. <laughs> we will ensure yeah. it is safe by that time, sir. <laughs> and I know how difficult it is in India to stay distant. Uh, I love my Indian friends. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right. Okay. All the best. Uh, and once again, good night, everybody. Good evening and good morning, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, ma'am. And bye.